from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning and welcome to Face the State. I'm David Parker, MTN political analyst, joined as always by Chief Local Reporter Mike Dennison. The Affordable Care Act, commonly known as Obamacare, has been with us now for about six years. It's been celebrated by some for increasing access to health care by removing preconditions and expanding care to the poor, while others have attacked the law for increasing red tape and reducing quality care. In short, the law has become a political football. Going into an election season, where the law will again sit front and center for campaign ads, we wanted to shed some light on the truths, falsehoods, and misperceptions of the Affordable Care Act. To do that, we are joined today by Monica Lundin, Monica, uh, Montana State Auditor and Commissioner of Securities and Insurance, and Dick Brown, President of Montana Hospital Association. Monica, Dick, thanks for joining us again today. Thank you. Happy to be here. So first question, right? We've got the Affordable Care Act in place. It's been in operation for about six years. How would you each grade it? We'll start with Monica. Well, I appreciate the question. I mean, it's, it has been six years, but the first couple of years were really um, regulators and the federal government ramping up to begin implementation and to put some standards in place. So um, we really only have been in the marketplace now for th about three years. And I would say that it's incomplete. I wouldn't give it a letter grade. It's certainly, we've got, we're, in a, we're still in a transition period and we're still working through some of the bumps, but we've got a ways to go, obviously. Dick, how would you grade the, the law? You know, I'm right with Monica. I think it is incomplete at this point. Hard to put a real grade on it. Um, we've been in Montana's ACA program for just uh, two and a half years, Medicaid expansion for just over six months. So we've got a lot, a long ways to go, don't have a lot of experience. I, it is incomplete, and hopefully uh, five or six years we can give you a better grade. <laughs> Monica, you mentioned the marketplace, which of course uh, for our viewers is the place where individuals can go and buy policies and get, subs get subsidies dealt and pay for that. Mm -hmm. Just last week we heard that those Policies are going to have probably big increases this year. They had fairly big increases last year, and it's been attacked by the critics of the law. What's going on there? It, is that an indication that it's really not working since we're having such large increases in, in those policies? No, I think that's an unfair um, criticism to make at this point in time. I mean, first of all, I think that we need to kind of calm the public fears here in that we're not talking about all health insurance policies increasing at that rate. Um, you, you realize that there's probably just under a million folks in Montana who are covered under health insurance. Um, most of them are actually covered by um, group policies, by their employer. It's about half, right? Um, yeah, almost half. Yeah. yeah, almost half. And then you, of course, have Medicare, you have Medicaid. And when you look at the individual marketplace, you have policies being sold on and off. And that's where these big increases are being, um, that were being talked about. Those are the filings that everyone's focused on. And when you look at even those folks who are in the individual marketplace, which is about 80 some thousand at this point, um, you have somewhere around 56,000 who are on the exchange. And of those 56,000, about 87% uh, of those folks take advantage of the federal tax credit, which as a result, make it affordable. They won't be affected by those increases. It's the folks who aren't eligible for the tax credits or the folks off the marketplace who aren't even applying for the tax credits that are really gonna be affected. So if my math is correct, I think that's about 1% of Montanans that would be affected by those increases. Um, around 10, one to two, somewhere to in two. there. One to two, somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And remember that those folks who potentially would be impacted can look at other products that are offered to see if they can find something that's um, less expensive. And there are folks who are um, buying individual products off the exchange who, who could look at buying on the exchange and potentially be eligible for those tax credits. Unfortunately, because of a lot of the politics that have surrounded um, the Affordable Care Act now for five, six years, there are folks who philosophically are refusing to go and look at the exchange as an option and maybe hurting themselves in the pocketbook as a result. Let's talk about why those increases are occurring though. I mean, what's behind that big increases? What's behind some of the money that's not flowing to 
the insurers that we thought was going to be flowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also talk about healthcare costs in a minute too. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think that there are a number of factors, obviously. Um, you do have the costs and, and they, the insurance companies will tell you that they are paying out more in claims than they are bringing in a premium and there is some truth to that. But we also knew going in that this was going to occur because there was going to be pent up demand from folks who had not had insurance for a long time. Okay, So <laughs> that pent up demand will increase the amount of claims, but then eventually it's going to start to level off. Um, so that's a fact, that's true. And as a result, when the bill was passed at the federal level, the Affordable Care Act, there were payments that were supposed to go to the insurance companies to help them defray those costs during that transition period. Unfortunately, again because of the politics, uh, there have been budget cuts made at the, f at the federal level by the Republicans which then have affected those payments and now the companies are having to make up for that cost as well. So Dick, have you seen, have the hospitals here in Montana, have they seen that pent up demand? Have you seen more people coming in to see primary care physicians as a result of the ACA? Has that been occurring? It is occurring. Um, when the uh, ACA really enrolled in Montana in 14, you started to see the numbers increase at that time. Um, Medicaid expansion, now you've seen more people coming, coming in as well. It's an interesting number though, because we were serving these people before through ER, mm -hmm. uh, and now they're coming in actually through clinics. They're coming through, through hospital clinics, um, through individual clinics. Um, so I think the numbers are coming up, but what we're seeing more is, is hospital inpatients, um, probably the pent up need for that type of service. That's good, right? It's because good. it's cheaper in the long run. It's cheaper in the long run to take care of what the needs are today. And over time, I think as Monica indicated, you're gonna see some of this start to level off in cost. ACA, Medicaid expansion, the number is always increased to begin with, and then it starts to level off once you take care of that initial bit of need. So there is going to be that cost increase at the beginning because now we have more people. You have sicker people who have, have not been taking care of stuff. Mm -hmm. But over time, as they start coming to the system and getting, going to the doctor, we should see that cost indeed go down. So it's, 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 it's like a blip. Well, you would, hope, you would hope that would be the case. It may be a new normal for us. I mean, I don't think anything's going to come all the way back down. You're going to see a new normal because there's more people getting services. But that initial bolus of care certainly is going to be more costly. And Dick, you mentioned Medicaid expansion, yes. uh, which, we, which has been in effect for about six months. And we have 47,000 people signed up so far, about twice what the initial projections were. Uh, I'm just wondering a couple of things. One, what are you seeing at hospitals in terms of people covered by Medicaid? Is it too early to say how that's going to affect who comes there and, and how it's going to affect your bottom line. We have $75 million mm -hmm. already been spent by the federal government. And also, as we look forward, uh, how much is this going to cost the state when we have this many more people coming in? Well, fortunately, the current um, patients coming through, it's 100% covered by federal funds. And so over time, over the next four or five years, you're going to see that decrease down to uh, 90%. The, um, the number of people that are coming in, there's a bit of a shift. We're seeing the self-pay numbers drop way down and Medicaid numbers going up in just sheer numbers of patients. So I think we're seeing what we naturally would have thought is, is fewer mm -hmm. self-pay, which is great. We're seeing people with, uh, with coverage now. We've done a quick study on, on, on the first three months, um, don't have the second th um, quarter in yet. Um, margins hardly moved. Um, you're seeing emergency room numbers uh, tweaking up a little bit. Uh, bad debt and charity haven't moved a lot yet. They've, they've gone up during, um, bad debt had gone up a little bit during the first few years of the ACA. Charity of care has gone down, but now this year we're starting to see a bit of a leveling off. So we think that's good. We think Medicaid Im, um, impact has, has uh, or the Medicaid expansions had an impact on that for healthcare. Um, clearly there's more costs involved for the patients, but there's more costs now for healthcare because they've got uh, more services, they're hiring more people in some regards to provide services. Um, so, so it's, again, one, one quarter is, is not much to go on, but that's yeah. what we're looking at. Well, can I add to that in terms of the Certainly. cost? If you recall, it was back in uh, 20, 2011 when our, our office had commissioned um, the University of Montana to do an economic impact study and look at Montana's health insurance marketplace. 
And one of the things that they talked about and really looked at was the economic, how much economic impact would there be if Medicaid expansion occurred. And it was a huge positive. We're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to the state of Montana, which obviously a lot of that's job increase, good paying jobs. You're going to have an increase in the amount of uh, revenue that comes into the state as a result to help offset the state cost as well. What has actually happened to the number of uninsured here in Montana as a result of the ACA? Well, the num well, obviously, if you look back at that study again, thanks for bringing that question up. When we did the study, they found that there were about 20% uninsured here in Montana. Um, we've seen that drop off over the last three years. And since Medicaid expansion went into effect, now it's dropped off even more. We are now yeah. at 7.4% uninsured in Montana. That, so that's, you know, more than half. And it's, it's great news. Um, for us, and I think that, uh, as again, it's still early, but if we can continue that trend and if we can finally get this marketplace stabilized, it's going to be good for everyone in Montana. And the big chunk of that is Medicaid expansion. Oh, yeah. Yes. I mean, that was huge when you picked, put almost 50,000 more people um, in, get them in, get them coverage. Boy, that really dropped the numbers this year. Now, this who are these year. people getting Medicaid expansion? I mean, basically, what type of people, who are the type of people that are that are now eligible under the expansion? Sure, well typically it's a population 19 to 64, not eligible for Medicare yet. So it's that population who otherwise has not had health care insurance or coverage. Uh, their incomes are below the 138% of poverty. Uh, they may be working, but again, it's, it's in income based. So it's that, uh, that population. I think the numbers, um, younger people 30, or excuse me, 19 to 34, 35 is probably the biggest group that has come in. A lot of young invincibles, um, they do have some type of work, but they don't have the full coverage and they weren't eligible otherwise. So I think that's what the population you're seeing come in right now. Now isn't, isn't basically expanding the folks that are actually insured, that are actually going in and getting care. Now a lot of people talk about it's, you know, it's the right thing to do, it's a humane thing to do, but isn't there a public health aspect to it? Think of Zika, right? We need people to see physicians right. to identify these particular diseases. So isn't this, isn't this really an important thing just overall because of potential for public health emergencies, people not getting health care? Well, it is, and, and some of the anecdotals we're picking up uh, just from different communities are people who have not had care before, dental care, which can make a lot of difference in just your whole psyche of what you're doing, um, and not had a health uh, physical for years, if ever. Those are the types of things that are happening, and when that happens, uh, there are services that are going to be provided at a different level, at a higher level, and now they can get taken care of. So you're exactly right. This is a long-term health improvement um, for the people that are now uh, been getting coverage. When you think about employers too, I mean, if you have um, people underneath that are employed by you who are now getting care, um, whether it be dental care or what have you, they're healthier, they're more productive, and that that that's good for business. I mean, and obviously, um, that's going to help all of us who have been kind of carrying the cost mm -hmm. for the uninsured, and it's hopefully then will help stabilize the rates in that way as well in the future. Long term. You know, these, these data that you, you talk about in terms of the increase in coverage, certainly good news, but we don't hear a lot about controlling costs or reducing the cost of health care. We are getting more people covered, but we're still spending way more money than other countries on health care. And I'm just not convinced that the ACA has really done much to control those costs. I mean, we look, look at the increases in the, uh, in, uh, on, the, on the exchange, that's tied to cost too. Has the AC done anything to really control costs in this country? You know, I, if I could, I'll just say a couple things and then Go you ahead. can talk from the, the, your perspective. I mean, obviously, there have been some things that it's done <clears throat> for the consumer. I mean, when you look at the consumer that's able to now take advantage of those tax credits, people who could never afford health care coverage now are, are taking advantage of the ta tax credits on the exchange. It's affordable now for them, so it's cheaper. Um, you have... Um, Preventative care that is now zero dollar, which folks did not have before. So that's that's a benefit as well. And I think that, well, the Affordable Care Act, I think there's a misnomer sometimes that it was supposed to solve the whole problem with health care costs. Um, it has, it doesn't. It's really focused more on insurance, but there's a lot of things in there that wants us to move towards working on the health care costs, like um, doing things like patient-centered medical homes and ACOs and that sort of thing. 
Well, exactly. I mean, the, the ACA has um, prompted a lot of initiatives going mm -hmm. forward, value-based purchasing, bundled payments, uh, primary care, medical home. Um, those are all in demonstration. They really haven't come through fruition yet. It'll be, a, it'll be years probably before some of these things happen. But, you know, to your point, Mike, the, the, the cost will go up. I mean, we have just in Montana, how many, 100,000 more people that can consume health care in a more effective way. And mm -hmm. so as we diagnose certain treatments, it's going to be more costly for a while. So I don't think we can avoid that. Um, providers, uh, hospitals, others are being very conscious about looking internally at where they can um, control their own internal costs. But as we add more services, it will take more staff. So there's going to be a cost. Uh, this country wants the best and they want it right now. So technology continues to improve, which is a good thing, but there's a cost to it. Pharmacy, we have tremendous costs in pharmacy and there's a lot of use of pharmaceuticals which is that's a national movement now to take a look at that so i think it's going to take a lot of initiative mike from statewide uh, nationally to really focus on now that we've got coverage how do we really harness this cost and it, it that's a huge challenge i think and I'm, I'm a big believer as well in thinking that there's some personal responsibility that each of us needs to take in order to help drive down costs in the future. And I know that this is a, a much bigger discussion and it's something mm -hmm. that has to do with our culture, but we've all got to learn to take better care of ourselves. We need to eat better, we need to exercise more, we need to not smoke. And at the same time, mm -hmm. I think that we need to be better consumers of health care. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. <laughs> um, if you want to pull up the first graphic there that I have, not the video, but the graphic, and this is actually from the Commonwealth Fund study of healthcare costs in 13 countries. And this is apples to apples. So these are mm -hmm. OECD nations as wealthy as the United States. 2014 study published, 17% of GDP in the US is spent in healthcare, whereas you go to France, it's at 11, 8% uh, in the UK, it's forecast to be 18% in 2016. What's interesting is you'll get all these metrics, we're last on so many of them. And not only that, we are, we are last in terms of our own personal responsibility in our own health care. Yeah. Britain is second to last, and yet they're number one. They have, they have a single-payer system. Doctors all work for the government there. The go government has the ability to negotiate prices on drugs and all these other things. And not only that, the satisfaction of care in a lot of these other countries is a lot higher. In fact, Great Britain, 63% are basically very happy with their health care there. So clearly, other countries are doing it better. Why, why are we not doing as good a job? And we'll start with, we'll start with Dick. Well, again, I, I think part of it is this country, we want everything now. So we're not worried about the costs until after the fact. Um, most of the countries cited in your chart do have universal or, or national coverage for health care. It, it costs them at some point, the individuals that are paying for that. Um, I think for, for this country, we really have to figure out the quality and the cost metric before we could even consider going to some kind of a national um, health care. We've got a VA system and Indian health system that are maybe underfunded, maybe not uh, managed as well as they could be. I think if we could harness that um, or improve those systems and maybe then begin to look at what could happen on a national basis. I just don't think we're aligned with all of those at the table to move that forward. Um, it's costly in this country and I, I think we've got a lot of work to do before we can ever slow that down. But do we really need to be paying I mean, I look at the physicians on staff on hospitals around the state, which says public information. Mm -hmm. Physicians getting paid $800,000, $900,000 a year, $1.3 million, $1.5 million. Do we really need to pay these people this much? And, and the hospital st staff as well. I mean, the executives at hospitals get paid a lot of money. I mean, is that, w when is that ever going to, uh, not stop, but uh, <laughs> maybe not keep going up? You, you know, those are questions all the time we get, Mike, is, is the, the value and, and the cost of, of running um, major organizations that can, you know, are involved with the health care of an entire society. Um, I don't know what the answer is there. I mean, I'm not going to debate whether the, the price is, is right or not. Um, part of what we have in, in rural states like Montana is the ability to attract specialists. Mm -hmm. And without specialists, we don't provide oncology. We don't do cardiac services. We don't do the types of services. So, so there is a, maybe an additional cost component for us if we want those services available for, uh, for the citizens of the state. Um, I don't know if you have any comment, Monica, but that's kind of where I would <laughs> I know, it's a, it is a really tough question, but, you know, <clears throat> I think that there are, there are many tough conversations that have had, been had, but we need to have more. 
because the chart you show really does point out the fact that we have a long way to go before we um, can really claim to be, you know, the most affordable in the, in the world. Yeah. But at the same time, I think that there, there are things happening on the ground right now that I think are really positive. And that's this whole idea of looking at models that look at um, patient care in terms of quality you know, looking at um, like the patient-centered medical home where we're trying to do quality care versus fee-based care. I think that that's a real positive step in the right direction, but the, unfortunately, it, it's not immediate. These things take time, and the, the benefits from those types of models will pay out in the long term. You know, Dave, on your, on your question, um, I, I guess the other question would be, is that a bad thing, the position that we are compared to the rest of the world? And without knowing all of the other parts of it, is that a bad thing? And then I guess if we had the answer to that, then we begin to resolve how do we improve that if we need to. Well, I mean, for example, we have three times the mammograms uh, relative to other OECD countries. We have 31% more C-sections, two and a half more MRIs. One question is we might have the technology, mm -hmm. but isn't there a, then if you have an MRI, MR, MRI machine, you want to use it, which that drives up costs as well. So isn't there this part of the structure uh, 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 for a profit-based care is that you have these machines you want to use them. Isn't that part of the problem here? Whereas in these other countries, because the profit's taken out of it, you're not as apt to use these machines because you know the real cost. Well, that's clearly part of the issue. But I do think um, this whole value-based, pay, pay on, on value versus volume, maybe we'll begin to see that change. Because we're getting more people in the system. Why are you getting more people in the system, but if, if um, especially Medicare and Medicaid are going to pay on quality outcomes, which is what insurers will do, is every, every MRI necessary or not? I don't know the answer to that, but, but then we will find that out as we go through a, a change sure. in our system. I want to get back to something about the Affordable Care Act just in general, as far as who is benefiting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't pull well in the country. It's not that popular. I think maybe one reason why, you know, if I'm on Medicaid, yeah, it's great, uh, Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. If I'm getting a subsidy from my policy, that's good too. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not getting that, where's the benefit for me? I, m my thought is, well, I'm, I'm just paying for it. So where's the benefit for all the people who are not getting those direct benefits that we've talked about? Like the 58% of the people, 50% of the people in Montana that, for example, is serviced by an employer plan. What's the benefit we get? Well, I mean, remember that some of those marketplace um, um, reforms also occurred with the group policies as well and um, there were grandfathered policies where they didn't have to implement those at first but as those are being phased out those market reforms are being phased into those policies where they are getting the preventative care services at a zero dollar cost and and no longer being you know denied coverage because of pre-existing conditions so those are some, and if you take and you poll those things separately they poll highly it's just that, unfortunately, I believe that because of the politics that are being played with this particular um, law over however many years, you know, there's a negative attitude towards it. And frankly, and I've told people this a long time ago, I think that the uh, administration did a real disservice um, by not talking about the benefits up front um, loud and clearly because I think that there was kind of this vacuum mm -hmm. and it got filled with a lot of... Um, uh, rhetoric. <laughs> not, not that there aren't some things wrong with the ACA, because I can tell you as an insurance commissioner who's been dealing with this at the state level and the national level, and all my colleagues across the country, Republican, Democrat, and Independent, we have our frustrations too. Um, but getting those changes made in Congress to make this a better law is uh, almost nil to difficult, if not impossible, because of that political football that's being played at the federal level. Well, and again, it's early in the game, I think. But if you look at the cost shifting that had gone in health care prior to the ACA and the Medicaid expansion, um, we were taking care of a lot of folks who couldn't pay, mm -hmm. and it was very costly. Somebody did have to cover those costs, so that became an insurance issue. So insurers, maybe we're paying more, we're paying more for premiums. Hopefully over time, and again, this, we're early in the game, that as Medicaid coverage improves and, and the ACA stays strong, that cost shift will start to go away. And maybe that's what starts to slow down this overall cost. Yeah. You talk about the political football. We've seen Obamacare and ads, and we, it's, it's happening in Senate races again in this cycle. Uh, as soon as those rate increases were announced on that yeah. roughly 1% to 2% of Montanans, 
the Montana Republican Party sent out a press release and said that uh, you are imposing, Monica, these <laughs> rate increases. Uh, are you imposing these rate increases? No, I'm not. Um, unfortunately, they might want to take a, take a moment to just look at what this office does. I mean, up until <clears throat> three years ago, when the legislature finally gave my office the ability to review those rate filings, we never even saw those rate filings before that. I mean, the companies did their mm -hmm. annual rate changes. We didn't know really what they were unless a consumer called to complain. And then we started hearing about it. Now that they are filing the rates with us, we have the ability to review them to, find, to, to see if they are um, um, appropriate <laughs> and not excessive and, un, and if they're unjustified or not. And through that process, we can go back to the company over that time period, which is 60 days, and say, we see an issue here, we see an issue there, we think this is excessive, and they can voluntarily then decrease the rates. And if they don't, when we're done with the process, what I will do is I will come out with a public finding that says that it's unjustified. I was, as many people know, very shocked about just how excessive some of the rate filings were this time around for next year. And so I'm doing something I've never done before in the last three years, which is to actually have public hearings. I'll hold a public hearing in Helena on the 26th at eight, um, 9 o'clock a.m. and that'll be in the Scott Hart building. It'll be, we'll go have all three companies there to actually present um, their information about why these should be justified. I'll ask questions and then we'll have um, public comment period and we'll do a second one in Billings on August 3rd as well. Uh, you, you mentioned the unwillingness of some in Congress to change anything in the mm -hmm. ACI. I'm wondering if for each of you, if you could change one or two things, fixes or improvements, what would they be? Yeah, we've got about 30 seconds. Sure. Change. So, well, real quickly, the, the fact that we've got this gap between 100% and 138%, I think had for Congress the level. for the poverty level. I'm yeah, sorry. People, yeah. Had Congress just said at 100 percent or below, you're on Medicaid, and above, you were in the marketplace. I think that would have resolved a lot of the issues that we've seen mm -hmm. over this transition. Family glitch. Um, right now, the ACA does not allow um, a, a spouse in a family to get coverage under the ACA if another um, if the other spouse has employer coverage, and that's an issue mm -hmm. that could be yeah. fixed. Okay. So we, uh, about 90 seconds left, real quick. Co-op here in Montana, we've seen problems with around the whole country. Uh, we've had, what, 17 of them fail? Is that right? About seven left, I think, something yeah, like seven that. Seven left. And Montana's one of them. Uh, is it going to make it, do you think? Well, I think that uh, if we can get CMS and Congress to quit um, playing politics with the co-ops and, and cutting the funding that they needed and, and depended on when they set their rates, I think Montana's co-op has a good chance of survival. I'm very concerned right now because certainly if Blue Cross Blue Shield's rates hold where they're at right now, you're going to see an exodus from Blue Cross Blue Shield over to the co-op, and they can only handle so much capacity, and too much capacity could, could, could hurt mm -hmm. them. So they're, they're being tagged on both ends. One, they're not getting the risk corridor money that they were promised under the law to deal with the bump at the beginning. The other thing is that they might have overcapacity, which could drown them. So yeah. <laughs> either one's not very good. Yeah, welcome yeah. to my world. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just want to thank you, Monica and Dick, for joining us today on thank Face you. the State. And uh, we've had a good conversation about Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, join us next time, where I think we're going to be talking to uh, one of our public officials here in the state in August, and we might do another discussion about the convention. But until then, thanks for joining us here on Face the State. I'm Dave Parker. This is Mike Dennison. See you next time. The State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.